All right, well, thank you for uh, being here uh, this morning. Um, at the beginning, I was told that uh, most of the audience would be aware of uh, stock flow consistent modeling. Then I was told, no, there are more people coming in, and uh, many of them don't know uh, much about it or have only heard about it. So uh, I have added some uh, slides to what I had uh, initially prepared. Um, it, you know, okay, I'm supposed to talk for, well, not to talk. This session is supposed to be about an hour and a half, two hours, so at most we should be finished by 12, 30 at the most. Uh, I was thinking that since uh, it's not exactly, it's not really a lecture, it's more like a workshop. So in contrast to yesterday where I talked for continuously for an hour without questions, all the questions being only at the end. Uh, if you want to ask questions as I go, you're quite welcome. And if at some point I think there is too much chaos <laughs> because there are too many questions, you know, I'll say, okay, uh, that's enough. Uh, We'll have only questions towards the end, but you know, uh, if that doesn't happen, please just go ahead. And uh, if there's something you don't understand or something, a point you want to raise, go ahead, and, uh, and I'll talk. I'll, I'll be answering uh, your question, unless there's a slide uh, down below which specifically answers your question. Uh, so this is not a lecture, this is more a workshop and, and you can interrupt me uh, when you want. You are at ease with this. Okay, um, right. The, this is a picture taken uh, of Wynne, this is Wynne Godley. Uh, <laughs> when, when he was still young, I think he was in, in his 40s. And uh, that's him uh, teaching at the University of Cambridge. And it was uh, taken by a professional photographer. So it's a setup, you know, it's not, <laughs> it's not a student taking with God as he's trying to figure out what's going on with his equations. Um, so you, it's more equations, it's equations in fact related to the global balances for which is perhaps best known. Anyway, so that, that's, I thought, I was, uh, his, uh, his daughter uh, sent me three or four pictures of him that had been taken by the same photograph, and uh, I thought that was the best one, and that's the one which is on the book uh, that I edited with Gennaro Zetza, which was uh, the book of all well, of, of the papers that Wynne Godley, maybe a year before he died, thought uh, were his, uh, his most important papers. Okay, so this is uh, what I'm going to do. So first I'll try to give some background to this stock flow consistent approach. Uh, secondly, I'll uh, present what I think are the main features of this post Keynesian stock flow consistent approach because we'll see that there are other traditions in economics that have at least some form of stock flow consistency. And then at the end, and that will be uh, perhaps the more advanced part of the presentation, then I'll talk about the problems facing uh, this stock flow consistent approach modeling. And possible solutions which uh, have been proposed uh, most recently. Okay, so the justification and background. Uh, again, I'll be referring to the, to the crisis, and here you have a statement by Dirk Benzemer, who, uh, from what I know, was not especially uh, any uh, an heterodox economist, I think he was more like an orthodox economist, but during the financial crisis he, he kind of realized that, uh, well, some 
people seem to have the ability to somehow predict that something something bad could happen, and, and others didn't. So his point was that well, accounting or flow of funds models uh, turned out to uh, have been able to identify some uh, worrying trends. Uh, whereas the academic establishment did not. So then he says, well, in what sense are these things accounting models? They are in the sense that they represent households, firms, governments, balance sheets, and their interrelations. And so accounting identities play a major role in the model structure and outcomes. And uh, well, stop flow consistent is exactly that. It, it, uh, stop flow consistent is it's not stop flow consistent approach. It is not a model as such. It's just a framework. So it's a framework that can be utilized by anybody. You know, whether you are a Marxist, post Keynesian, uh, neoclassical author, you can always have this stop flow consistent approach. It's just a framework to make sure that you're not making a mistake. And, uh, maybe I'll come back about this. Uh, here's another statement by uh, Barwell and Burroughs who work at the Bank of England. I met one of the two at the Minsky Summer School. I think it was, uh, no it was not at the Minsky Summer School, it was in a conference in, uh, organized by INET. Uh, and uh, there's also a paper by these two guys at the European Central Bank. So there's a number of people in some central banks who are interested in, in this approach, uh, who believe that you know, having a better look at the flow of funds is, uh, <coughs> is rather important. So again, by building an account, you, um, okay, we, f we can ensure that we account for all the critical flows of financing that lead to the stocks of assets and liabilities in which financial fragility can build. So they, they do hope in the future to be able to, by looking at these balance sheets and so on, to make a contribution towards the detection of growing financial fragility. Um, I had a student uh, 20 years ago who worked very hard around flows of funds. That was for his master's thesis. Um, but the comments of the people that were on the jury was that, well, we're not really sure where this is leading us. So I think that uh, we're so in the past, people were rather, um, they, they were not very excited about flow of funds because they didn't know what to do with it. And so here what we have, we have if you include some behavioral equations into this framework, that takes into account flows of funds. And the claim is, well, maybe you, you can do uh, more than just look at some evolution of, of some, uh, some balance sheet. Uh, so, you know, there are people in academia and in central banks who believe that this is useful. Uh, let's look at the standard accounting matrix in macroeconomics. So it is presented within this uh, flow of funds, uh, well not flow of funds, but within this uh, matrix presentation that we use uh, in the SFC approach. But you know, if you look at macroeconomic textbooks, first year, second year, perhaps even more advanced textbooks, uh, Basically, this is what you have, and there are no banks. You can see banks are just not there. They don't seem to, to be playing any role. Uh, there's, the central bank is not there either. And uh, essentially what you're being told is that, well, the households receive wages and profits or some income that comes from the businesses. They consume, uh, they have to pay taxes, and then the rest is saving. And we don't have a clue where this saving is going. We don't have a clue how the investment is being financed by the firms. Uh, we don't know exactly how the government is, is uh, getting financed either. Uh, 
Uh, one thing I should mention here, because this is going to be useful in the future, you can notice that anything that is a source of funds has a plus sign. So for instance, the households receive wages, they receive profits, and then what do they do with them? So that's the users of funds with a minus sign. Well, they pay their taxes and they <coughs> use the money for to purchase consumption <coughs> goods. So for them, it's a it's a minus sign in front of consumption. For the businesses, it's the opposite. They receive payments uh, from the households, and therefore, it's a plus C here for the for, for the firm. So when we will be talking about transactions all in, in, in this flow of funds framework, always the plus sign is a source of funds and the minus sign is a use of funds. At this stage it's not really it's not very confusing, but it, it will be a slightly more confusing when we introduce um, the purchase of new assets. Um, Okay, so what is the drawback of the standard presentation that we have just uh, seen? Uh, as I was saying, where do where does personal saving uh, what form does personal saving take? Where does it go? Uh, where do the where does the finance for investment come from? How are government budget deficits financed? Uh, which sector provides the counterparty to every transaction in assets? Now, this, uh, the way the first year, second year, and even advanced macro textbooks are being presented is based, I think, on the 1953 United Nations way of presenting national accounts. Because in 1953, when Richard Stone put forward uh, the this, this structure of how the national accounts should be presented, uh, he did not have flows of funds, he did not have changes in assets and all that. It was only um, based uh, on income and product accounts. So in one way, one could say that, well, those first-year textbooks, second-year textbooks, and so on, neoclassical textbooks, are based on the national accounts as recommended by the United Nations back in, if you want to vote, you have to sign it, back in 1953. So, you know, the national accounts uh, have been fully integrated with the flows of funds since 1968. I mean, it doesn't mean every country is doing it, uh, but the structure has been there since 1968. In fact, when the uh, the system of national accounts came out in 1953. A, a lot of uh, a lot of French accountants and Dutch accountants were rather frustrated because they thought one could go much further than this. So they were critical of the work of Richard Stone. And since then, they, they have been revised in 1993 and 2008. So the, in, in several countries, the, the data is there. We, we could use it. Um, so there are some people working on trying to uh, update flow of funds to include uh, more stuff about shadow banking. Do you think that, um, that there is sufficient sort of information available now where the SFC modeling could be used to understand shadow banking, or do you think that more needs to be done for that to work? Well, I would think that some aspects of shadow banking is already there. No, I mean, I, I, but it's not like we could, in principle, create an SFT model that would allow us to really understand what's going on in shadow banking. Well, uh, maybe for some derivatives it would be uh, a little bit complicated. But certainly a, a, a part of shadow banking can certainly be incorporated. It, it's already there, I would think. Okay. Um, well, as I said at the very beginning, post-Kinsians are not the only ones who 
claim that what they do is stock flow consistent. I mean, even in a very simple neoclassical model, the solo model, for instance, the solo growth model, you could argue, is stock flow consistent in the sense that there is investment every period, and this investment adds to the stock of capital. So in that sense, it is stock flow uh, consistent. So, uh, and, and we were told about this uh, several times, so perhaps we, a better name would have been a post-Keynesian stock flow consistent approach, or real stock flow monetary model in the sense that we truly integrate the monetary side with the real side, which the, for instance, the solo growth model does not, or uh, the financial stock flow <coughs> coherent approach to emphasize that, again, that we're dealing with uh, monetary values and financial assets, which the, most of the neoclassical models don't, or the sectoral stock flow coherent, coherent approach <coughs> in the sense that in all of these post-Keynesian models, uh, we divide uh, the economy in several sectors, the banking sector, perhaps the shadow banking sector, uh, the government sector, the central bank, the, the firms, and so on. And even the firms you could subdivide in different kinds of, of firms. Uh, so retrospectively, yeah, maybe we should have Used. And some of these terms were used at some point by Win Godley uh, in his articles before he was really uh, he had really described what he wanted to do when you know when he was doing preliminary work. He was, I think he was using the word the expression real stock flow monetary. Uh, here's a family tree of several uh, several different different uh, people who do, as, as it says here, accounting-based macro models. So this picture does not come from me, it comes from a, a French, uh, well, a person who was a French student who came to University of Ottawa to learn about stock flow consistent models. Uh, then it was explained to him by the students that are PhD students. I had then who were, I had a couple then who were working on this. Then he went back to France and he finished his dissertation before my students did. <laughs> and and uh, well, this is something that he, he published in, in one of his uh, papers. So uh, yeah, you can link accounting base with input output growth models. Uh, you can link this with computable general equilibrium models. So there certainly is a link. Lance Taylor is here. He was uh, doing these uh, computable general equilibrium models when, uh, in his earlier days when he was at MIT. And uh, there are there there is one variety of these models, which I think was used at the World Bank, uh, which had which was putting together the financial side and the real side, but with neoclassical assumptions. So that's one brand. Then if we look at Richard Stone, so he was the leader of this Cambridge Growth Project, which was supposed to set up the national accounts and go beyond that. And this gave rise to, uh, well, a variety of models. We have some here. Uh, it gave rise to uh, what is called the Yale General Equilibrium Models or the um, uh, the pit, it's also called sometimes the pitfalls approach or the New Heaven approach because the University of Yale as you know is in New Heaven and it also gave rise to the new Cambridge models, in particular the paper by Wynne Godley and Francis Cripps, and that gave rise to what we call SFC models, at least the post-Keynesian variety. But even the uh, Tobin Brainerd approach uh, had a, an impact on computable general equilibrium models. It had an impact on models built by uh, Sargent and Ternovsky before they became, you know, more neoclassical people and less Keynesian. And it gave rise to uh, 
there's a, there, there are many books published by uh, Peter Flaschel from Germany, Willy Semler, who is at the New School, Chagala, who is um, in Australia, and Frankie, who is also in, uh, in Germany. And those are called the KMG uh, models. Um, G for Goodwin. K, uh, M for Meltzer, and K for Keynes. And so those are sophisticated models, um, which, at, at least the, the last generation, is certainly fully stock flow consistent. And so, you know, we could say that all these, mob, all these people here are kind of cousins uh, but th these would be here more first cousins, and those would be like second generation cousins. So it's just to say that what you read in, by post Indian authors is, uh, is one brand among many brands of stock flow consistency. Here is a picture made by those two guys, Kevin Zadzi and Godin, Antoine Godin, who is uh, from, from Belgium. And so he has uh, a survey paper who sh that should soon be published in the Cambridge Journal of Economics. I think you can find it on the web. And, uh, and there he, had, he looked at all the papers that have been published in this post Keynesian and stock flow consistent uh, approach. Uh, you know, trying to see are there any collect, collect, uh, connections between the various people. So, you, know, you can see I'm, I'm out there. Uh, Gennaro Zenza was a collab close collaborator of Godly. In fact, he was his assistant in the 1980s. And then he was a close collaborator at the Leave Institute. And uh, Claudio dos Santos is a Brazilian who also, who was a student at the New School and then worked with helping with win godly with the empirical side uh, at the Leaf Institute. Jacques Mazier is uh, someone who is from the French regulation school. So he's a polytechnician, you know, somebody who is very able with uh, mathematics and all. Um, and uh, for some reason he got very, very excited uh, by the stock flow consistent approach and uh, has many, many students who, who do this kind of work and, and do it very well. And Stephen Kinsella is also a former uh, student from the New School, and he has also embarked in this, and he's very active. He organized this uh, workshop combining agent-based modeling and stock flow consistency uh, very recently. He's in uh, Ireland. Uh, and very good also with uh, econometrics and mathematics. And here, Edwin Loeron is, uh, well, okay, the, the, the person I was mentioning who had the previous, who made the previous slide, uh, oops, <coughs> was uh, a former student of Edwin Leiron, so uh, they have also uh, written several papers together. Um, different people focus on different things. Mazier uh, focuses quite a lot on open economy models with two countries, three countries, four countries, the Eurozone and so on. Uh, Leiron, uh, he focuses on banks, so he, 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 he makes the rest of his model very, very simple, and the complicated part in his model is the banking sector. So, uh, Matthew, you were ref referring to shadow banking sector. Well, uh, you know, if any of you were interested in that, I would recommend to make the rest of the model highly simple, and then you can complexify one part of the model, which would be maybe the banking sector and the shadow banking. Yeah, there are different people who have written a, 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 either a working paper or published a paper that used this stock flow consistent approach. So there are people, that, there are some uh, 
at the Minsky Summer School three or four years ago, there were a couple of uh, people from Greece who uh, they both have published. Um, so they are all over. I, I think they have identified about a hundred papers. And after, that was the first draft of their paper. And I, I think when they had to write the revised version, there was another 20. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's growing fast. It, it's, right now it is fashionable. Maybe it won't be in five years, but right now it is. <laughs> Okay, uh, the main features of the post keynesian stock flow approach. So I, I try to explain what is the method. Uh, here I have um, something that is taken from the first paper that Wynne and I uh, did together in 2001, that was published in the Journal of post keynesian in 2001-2002. Um, I don't know if I should tell anecdotes or waste, waste time on that or not, but uh, well basically what happened is that in 1999 um, there was a visiting professor at Carleton University in the University of Ottawa where I am. So there were four of us who decided to have a little workshop. So every three weeks or four weeks we would meet and discuss some paper that had been recently published. Just the four of us. And uh, I suggested to read the paper by uh, Wynne Godley that had just come out in the Cambridge Journal of Economics. And then there was an equation we just could not figure out. How did he arrive at this equation? So I sent an email to Wynne Godley telling him that four full professors just couldn't get his <laughs> equation. And uh, he answered back, well, that's not surprising. There's a mistake in it. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, he, he gave a presentation uh, at our department and uh, after that I sent another email I said well I'm working on this paper there I need to integrate capital gains in, in this but I can't do it I don't see how I can, it can be done and then he wrote back to me and said well that's easy I'll, I'll do it uh, for you and then we decided to write the paper together and that gave rise to this paper so <clears throat> um, so this is the balance sheet um, and the crucial thing is that any financial asset must have a counterpart so any asset ha carries a plus sign so here for instance the household hold deposits so there's a plus sign in front of D for deposits but it, has, you, it needs to have a counterpart, which will be the liability for some other sector. So in this case, the liability is the banks. The banks issue, well, so-called issue deposits. So from the standpoint of the bank, this is a liability. So it carries a negative sign. Here it's pretty simple in the sense that the only households hold deposits, but we could also have firms holding deposits. And then the sum of all these things must be zero. It's got to be zero. And the loans, it's the same. The loans from the standpoint of firms, B for borrowing, are a liability. And so it's the asset of someone else plus sign. So and here the stock market shares. S is uh, the number of shares. PS is the price of shares. There's only one exception, it's tangible goods. Tangible goods don't have a counterpart uh, because they, they are not financial assets. So fixed capital or, um, thing, or if you consider that a car is an investment, it would be there. Uh, a house is, a, is a tangible capital or the inventories of uh, companies uh, would also be among the tangible assets and so when you add them up then at the end of the row it would always be positive and not zero. So you start with this, this is your structure. It, it's good to start with this because automatically right away you know what is the structure of the model that you're trying to build. People look at that and they know right away what you're talking about. 
they know if you have omitted the government or not, like here, uh, and so on. So as I said, it's, it's just a, a method to make sure you're not... Did you discuss the balance world? Yeah, uh, well, okay, what happens is that when you have a, ba I mean, when you have a balance sheet, you, you know, you have the assets on the left-hand side, you have the liabilities on the right-hand side, but in fact, it's, it's usually called liabilities and net worth. So anything which is on the liabilities and net worth carries a negative sign. So this is what happens here. You have the balance, which is in fact the net worth of, the, uh, of these households. So here we, we did not assume that they, they, don't take any, they don't take any loans. So it's pretty simple. Their net worth is the sum of the money they are holding and the shares that they own. Uh, sometimes it's a little bit confusing when you look at the uh, government or the firms. Here is the same. You know, uh, the firms have net worth. This is the net worth of the firms. From a national account point of view, this is how the net worth is being determined. So it's the difference between their assets. They could also be holding deposits. And it's the difference between that and their liabilities. So from a national account perspective, the shares that they have issued are a liability. Uh, but from a, a corporate perspective, you would probably say that you know, uh, this net worth would be equal to the, cap, the, the financial assets minus these liabilities. And, and you would not consider this to be part of it. Because, I, yeah. Uh, but it doesn't matter, you know. Why are the same, though? I mean, should, should that be a different subscript for the firm? Yeah, it should be a different uh, subscript. You're right. So that's a mistake I have to correct in the proof of my book. I took that from the book. <laughs> right. I try to remember. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it should be VF, and then the sum of the two should be uh, equal to minus. And if you, I don't, I'm not sure about the U.S., but I know in Canada, as I said, the national income and product accounts and the flow of funds are fully integrated, and uh, and, and so uh, these things are supposed to balance perfectly except for errors and omissions. Any other question? Okay, so assets have a plus sign, liabilities have a minus sign. Uh, and then we move on to the transaction flow matrix. And uh, so here we have uh, some conditions. I mean, to make sure everything is consistent, it must be Make sure that all rows sum to zero, all columns sum to zero, and we'll, we'll see those are the columns you can interpret as being the budget constraints. And uh, as Wynne used to say, everything comes from somewhere and everything goes somewhere, and there should be no black holes. Um, and uh, again, I can tell uh, Two anecdotes. There's a French guy who publishes one paper every month almost. And, and when I was just starting to work with Wynne, he got a paper where he had compl a complicated model with fi many financial assets and all that. About 80 equations he had in his paper. So I very carefully went through every equation. I was sure it was not consistent. He must have forgotten something. He didn't have the matrices, you know, didn't show the matrices whatsoever. Then I went through everything, there was no mistake. It was fully consistent, so I was really impressed. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I've, I've seen uh, other papers where, uh, if, you know, if we move to the next slide, where uh, the author would have, uh, for instance, I don't know, um, where the, the, the firms would be or the banks would be paying interest on uh, deposits, 
but then the author would forget that, hey, the households are receiving the interest payments. So now I think people are much more careful uh, in writing out their models, I think thanks to the method. Uh, but uh, this, you know, I remember seeing this in a paper presented around 2003, 2004 in a conference. And uh, yeah, I, 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 you know, I could often, not often, but once in a while I could pick up a hole. There was a black hole in the, in the model. So this is the so-called transaction flow uh, matrix, which is the second matrix that you use to make sure that your model is consistent. Um, so again, you know, all the uh, rows must sum to zero. All the columns must sum to zero. Um, and okay, as I said before, the plus signs means that this is a source of funds. And the minus sign means that it's a use of funds. So we have already seen you know, this part. The new part is down here. Uh, well, you also have interest on loans, interest on deposits. But the, the really new part is here, change in loans, change in deposits. So here it's a little bit confusing, because from the standpoint of the households, the change, the increase in deposits is an increase in assets. So automatically you think, well, an asset has a plus sign. But here, an increase in deposits carries a negative sign. It's minus the change in deposits. The reason is that it's a use of funds. You receive your wages and your profits. Well, dividend income. Here, PD is dividend income. Uh, you receive that from, say, essentially the firms, uh, perhaps also from the banks, but we omit this for simplification. And then what you do, part of it is consumed, uh, and then you may purchase new shares, delta S, you purchase new shares, and you will add to your deposit. So, this is how you use your funds. This is how you use your income. So that's, this is why it carries a negative sign. It's usually very confusing for students the first time they see it. So this column here must sum to zero, and that's what our neoclassical colleagues would call a budget constraint. Um, so uh, you have sources of funds on the one side, and then you know, what happens to it? Well, it's the uses of funds, and that's your constraint. Uh, he, I mean, the model is very simple, but we could also have a change in loans, just, just as we have for firms, in which case we would have here plus delta B for households. So that would be an additional source of funds for the households if they receive, uh, if they get loans from banks. And this is what um, Steve Keen is emphasizing. You know, he's emphasizing this very much, uh, claiming that aggregate demand is the sum of the income you got plus the change in loans. Oops, you know, the change in loans that could be here. And you would say the same, I guess, for firms. You know, the change in firms. So. Uh, you know, this is useful if you look at the firms from the capital uh, side. You would say, well, the firms are uh, purchasing investment goods. They are adding to their inventory stocks. So that's the use of their funds. And where does the funds come from? Well, they come from their pro the profits which have not been distributed. So that's non-distributed profits. That's the retained earnings. Uh, they can get new loans from the banks. And they can issue shares that will be sold at the price PS to, well, here in this case, to the household. So just having this uh, makes sure that uh, 
that everything <coughs> is consistent. And as I said, if you're a neoclassical economist and you're working on this kind of model, well, you, you would need to have exactly the same kind of uh, <coughs> matrix, flow matrix. Any question? Yes. So on the flow matrix, the sign like in front of delta D, would, it would always have that minus sign regardless of which direction the account is actually going, right? Even if my deposits were dwindling as well, opposed to increasing. Well, if your deposits are going down, <coughs> then delta D would be, say, minus 100. Mm -hmm. So you would have minus, minus 100, so okay. that would be plus 100. Whenever we were going over this um, in our uh, topics class as students, I was sort of thinking of it as another balance sheet, right? The household, uh, that's almost like another, it's like, you know, how consumption and consumption are opposite sides of the balance sheet between, uh, you know, firms and households. I sort of think of the assets and the uh, accepting of funds as two different uh, sides of I, I think the, the, well, the balance sheet is really, whoops, sorry. The balance sheet is this one. So this one you can, you can interpret that as a balance sheet where whenever you have a plus sign, it's on the left side mm -hmm. of the standard balance sheet. And whenever you have a minus sign, it's, on, right. it's on the right side of the balance sheet. That, that one is more like a uh, profit loss. The, uh, the other one that you show, the transactions, yeah. Yeah. P and L, I think it's called, what is it called here in the US, I don't know, income, income statement? statement? Yeah, more like an income statement. So I wouldn't say mm -hmm. this is a balance, this is not a balance. Can you just comment on the difference between the current and capital accounts under firms and banks? Okay. Uh, is it necessary? Why do we why do we break it down that way? Well, first, it's standard to do it in accounting. Um, it's true that it doesn't matter that much in the sense that it's got to add up to zero in any case. Um, I guess you could say, well, you know, uh, if you want to compute the profits of the firms, in fact, this is what you have to look at. And you, you can't just add everything. You have to look at this, and the profits of the firms would be the remaining out item that would balance the thing, you know, the, the overall color. I mean, those are payments you've got to make. Those, the wages, those are payments you've got to make. This, you know, is uh, what you didn't you produced and didn't sell, and uh, those are the um, and, and those are your sales in dollars. So, but isn't that what makes it a flow rather than a balance sheet? Because yeah, it's a flow. It this this is what time. I'm saying. It, it's a flow. Yeah. It's not a, But I think there's a, one difference is that in a standard income statement, you would have the bottom line, which would give you the profit at the end. But here you have a, the all net, net out. So you have a zero at the end. Yeah, at the end you have, sorry, you don't see it. It's, there's, there's a zero uh, in every column at the very bottom. Yeah, so I think that's one difference. Yeah, the but difference is that you would put this somehow in down that's below. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Typically, in sort of the models themselves, you wouldn't have an equation that says, uh, like, the investment uh, sold equals investment demand, or vice versa. But you do in sort of the NISIM model, um, for example, but then that sort of goes away in the later ones. And uh, could you say sort of why that is, and then, like, like whether you should think of when you're breaking it down into current and capital account, is that really sort of in the equations of the model itself, or is it just something that you put in in uh, these transaction and balance sheet matrices to sort of clarify what you think is going on, but might not be explicit in the equations themselves? Right. 
or am I looking at that wrong? No, well, we, uh, okay, what you're saying is that in the, at the beginning of the book, perhaps we distinguish between investment being demanded and investment being supplied, something like that. Yeah, yeah this was the, in, initially, uh, Wynn was opposed to put such things, investment demand, investment supply, he would just write it the way it is written here. Then Anwar Sheikh, who was also working at the Lick Institute with uh, Wynn Godley, insisted that everywhere, you know, even here, we should have wage uh, demand, wage supply, or labor demanded, labor supply. And uh, sometimes wind could be uh, easily influenced. So, uh, you know, for in the SIM model, this is what we did. Uh, but personally, I'm not at ease with that. You know, it's simply right the way it is written. There, there's no necessary relation to um, breaking it, breaking, say, investment into current capital account. Well, I, I would say what happens is that, you know, th those are, you have a whole sector, sector that takes all the firms together, but of course, you know, some firms are selling <coughs> investment goods to other firms. So you could split the firms into, into those producing consumption goods, those producing investment goods. The firms in the investment goods sector are selling investment goods to, in fact, both sectors. But you could have a kind of Sraffian uh, model here. Um, yeah, get, you know, uh, what happens here is that you're, you're kind of dividing your, the, the firm into two uh, components, one which is responsible for production and the other one uh, which is responsible for acquisition, so to speak. And so this is the part of the firm which is responsible uh, for production. So they are selling these investment goods. And then on the other hand, so they are, that's a flow of, that's a source of funds. And then you have the acquisition part of the firm, which is responsible for acquiring investment goods so as to grow. And these, this part of the firm uh, is purchasing the investment goods. So it's a use of funds. So that's why you have the minus sign here. I don't know if I'm clear enough. Yeah. Have you ever considered splitting the households and similarly? Um, when Current and wouldn't be capital, but maybe wealth. Um, you need to see the parallel for each sector. Um, yeah, you, you could, I guess you could do uh, I guess you could do it. You could say, because here our firms have no, our households have no investment. Uh, so when they're purchasing houses, then it becomes a bit more complicated. There are a few models that do that. It's always more com it's more complex. Um, I guess so. But you kind of have you have the their income and consumption and, and their store of wealth all kind of smushed into one column here. Yeah. 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 Uh, although. So you would need a line saying, okay, this, this, those are, so you, have, you would have the income, the consumption, then you would have another line saying, well, this is the saving of the household, and where does it go? It goes to purchase. Well, then you got it with your change in deposits. You have well, that's what it, the, the thing you'd have, the complementary line would be the, the plus, plus sign of oh. change in deposits would go in the, the store of well. Okay. Well, if you, if you want to do it this way, <laughs> uh, I don't mind. Uh, maybe it would be useful when you deal with real estate. I, 
at the beginning, I thought your question was, can we split households into uh, capitalist households and working working households? <laughs> and, but you can. The, there are models that do that precisely, uh, and where they have the capitalist households are are in fact well, the the the, the workers are renting are paying a rent to be able to live in dwellings to the capitalist households who own the, the dwellings. So, so what's you, the difference between the capitalist household and the firm? Then? Well, okay, it's even more complicated <laughs> than that because in the national accounts, as you know, uh, the, you have a real estate sector uh, which Houses, so to speak, are not in the in the household sector. They are in the, the firm sector, where you have a special sector called the real estate, real estate sector, where it is kind of assumed that the that sector is uh, uh, is getting uh, rent from the owners themselves. You know, so. Well, I, I guess I was just saying that those. Capitalist houses. You could say in your model would they belong in these terms? Uh, well, the purpose of subdividing the two is to try to see if uh, uh, if there is some emulation between the workers and the capitalists or the managers who have more income. Isn't the current of capital, isn't the idea similar to the international uh, balance of payment statistics, yeah. which you split into Good current sense. and capital? Good I think sense. it's a similar yeah. uh, principle behind that. One is kind of financing the, and covering the, um, you know, the flows, the income expenditures and flows in the current account, and then there is this essentially underlying shift in, in Yes. Yeah, you, you can look at you can look at the banks. They also have a current and a capital account, and uh, so the current account is all the income flows that come in and out, and the capital account is what happens to the assets and liabilities. <coughs> Any more questions on this? This is probably kind of esoteric, but coming up in the Midwest, um, a lot of the families that I grew up around actually did have capitalist households. My family are small business owners. They've always office out of their home. They've always parked their big equipment outside, you know. Um, so that would be uh, something interesting about uh, how would you, uh, if you're talking about class and what households do and whether or not they uh, actually have production that would well, you know, you can do whatever you want. I mean, <laughs> you, you can subdivide these things in whichever way you want. Uh, there's someone at the Department of Finance at the Canadian government who wants to build a stock flow consistent model using this framework. But, you know, in his mind, we got to divide the firms into uh, oil producing firms and manufacturing firms. And for him, that, that would be the the thing that he would be most interested in. Uh, so, you know, you, you can do whatever you, you want, and you just have to make sure it's consistent. As I said, it's a method, so you're, I mean, Wynne and I, we, uh, we never had, I mean, when we, we, we wrote the book, this is not the end of, you know, I mean, you, <laughs> you can do whatever you want with the method. In the book, basically, what we have are just examples. But uh, it doesn't mean this is the, the only true way of seeing macroeconomics. And, it, yeah. and as I said, it depends what your, the purpose of what you're trying to achieve. Okay, so uh, what's the main purpose uh, of the stock flow consistent models as developed by Wynne Godley in the 1990s? Uh, as I say here, for him, 
the holy grail of economics is the ability to integrate the real economy with the financial economy. So this is really what he was trying to achieve. So he was trying to find some way of achieving this. His first try was in this book with Francis Cripps that was published in 1983. It's a slim paperback book. Uh, he hoped that it would be, he, he, he thought, and I, it's a great book. It's a really, a you look at it now, and it's a great book. Uh, but it had very little impact. Uh, I, I, saw, I saw the book when it came out. I bought it. Uh, I was really fascinated. I went to Cambridge. The book came out in 83. I went to Cambridge for three weeks in 85. I met a few uh, post-Kinsians there. I asked one of them, the one who was taking care of me, I said, I'd like to meet uh, Wynne Godley. Would you help me? And he told me, uh, don't waste your time with this ignorant fool. <laughs> Those are the exact words because it really struck me. And, uh, and then I was a young professor, so I followed that advice. I didn't try, I should have, you know, I should have just gone to the Department of Applied Economics and tried to meet him. Uh, but uh, that's it. I didn't meet him in 1985, only met him 14 years later. Uh, so don't be overly influenced by your elders. <laughs> okay, so, you know, Godley says it quite precisely in that working paper that was published in 1996. By the way, another anecdote, when uh, Anwar Sheikh has it, or had his parents living in Ottawa, and so he came to my place uh, one day, uh, around 96, and he told me, oh, we have this uh, fellow working at the Levy Institute, Win Godley, he's doing really interesting work. I'm sure you would be highly interested. So I, I, he told me, look at his working paper in 1996. I, I looked at it, I was very enthusiastic. I was talking with my next door neighbor uh, at the department, Mario Sakareche, and I said, oh, this is the kind of work we've got to do. Because I had the feeling in 1996 that, you know, nothing new could really be said about monetary economics. Because, you know, what, what else can we say about besides the fact that money is endogenous, credits makes deposits, and uh, the natural rate of interest does not exist. So, uh, but then, you know, you, it's hard to get into this, so it's only three years later that I really got into it. Um, Minsky had a similar opinion. Minsky was also at the Levy Institute, so the two of them, uh, Godly Minsky, certainly communicated with each other. And so this is what he writes in his uh, chapter in a book published by Delaplace and Mel. The structure of an economic model that is relevant for a capitalist economy needs to include the interrelated balance sheets and income statements of the units of the economy. So basically he's saying, well, we need the balance sheet matrix and we need the transactions flow matrix. Uh, what I found exciting when I read the paper in 1996 was that I felt that it was integrating money viewed as a stock, which is the standard Keynes representation, and money viewed as a flow which is more the monetary circuit approach uh, that I had been exposed to when I was in France in the 1970s. So I, I thought this was uh, really exciting. And finally, something that I discovered uh, as we went is that, as I was saying yesterday, it, when we do the simulations, you can see what happens in the short run, and then you can see the evolution towards the long run. And the two may, you may get the same result, but you may also get different results in the short run and in the long run. So it gives you this traverse from one position to the other, which, as I said yesterday, is very important in post Keynesian analysis. Uh, okay, so I've, uh, normally we have three matrices. There's a third matrix that I didn't talk about, which is the revaluation matrix which tells you what happens when there are capital gains and capital losses. And when you put together the changes 
in the flows, which gives, tells you, for instance, the, the saving of the sector, you add to that the capital gains of the sector, well, that tells you by how much the wealth of that sector has been increasing. So by putting the three together, you, you've got the whole thing. Um, so, I, right, the, the claim here is that these SFC models allow you to put together the real and the monetary side within a single model, uh, and you deal simultaneously with financial assets and tangible assets. So that, I think that's why you know, a lot of post Keynesians take an interest in, in this. But as I, I said before, well, I, no, I, I, it's in the last slide. I mean, it doesn't mean everybody has to do it. I mean, it doesn't mean everybody has to do stock flow consistent models trying to achieve this. All I'm saying is that if you would like to achieve this, then this is a good method to do it. Um, yeah, to some extent, one can say that the stock flow consistent approach is a response to the critiques of post Keynesians who uh, believe that post Keynesian theory is not coherent, not scientific, not formal, not logical. Uh, I remember the first time I presented at the Eastern Economic Association, Duncan Foley was there, and he was very happy, he was very excited, he was saying, oh, at least, at long last, post Keynesians are doing something a little bit more formal, uh, which seems, you know, more coherent than what he had seen before. Uh, so, uh, so that, that's the, you know, perhaps a, a good side uh, of it. Uh, okay, well, Cripps, the godly in Cripps thought that you know, this allows us to, uh, to have a principle similar to the principle, principle of conservation of energy in physics by making sure all the rows go to zero, all the columns in the transactions flow matrix go to zero. And uh, Lance Taylor has written in his book in 2004 that these restrictions remove many degrees of freedom from possible configurations of patterns of payments at the macro level making tractable the task of constructing theories to close the accounts into complete models. So for him, that's important. It restrains the uh, number of possibilities that you have when building a model. Um, yeah, could, could you, uh, I mean, elaborate a little, a little bit more about the general advantages of this kind of uh, framework in terms of conservation of energy and things like that. Uh, is it something that you could Well, I, I, I think that, uh, or remember, when this was written, it was 1983, monetarism was coming forward. Monetarism was emphasizing the fact that, well, you've got these money stocks which play an important role. And the question that was then being put to Keynesians, well, well how do you integrate money in your models? And the only answer at that time was that, well, we've got this exogenous stock of money in the ISLM model, and uh, we're not even sure where it's coming from. So, uh, when and Francis Scripps were, uh, that was the purpose of their book. The purpose of their book was to show that even if you, we put away uh, the central bank, the government, government bonds, and so on, uh, you can create, you can explain how credit is being created and how money arises from the needs of the firms, from the fact that households want to keep some of their uh, wealth in the form of deposits and so on. So uh, what, what they were showing is that, for instance, the transition from one position to the other could not be anything. There were constraints. If, if, you want, if you have a certain level of money deposits and in the end you end up with a larger level, well, somehow, as you go from one position to the other, 
there's got to be some saving that will allow you to build up your stock of money deposits and hence your stock of wealth. And so the, the evolution of, say, your consumption relative to your income cannot just be anything. There's got to be a relationship between the difference between your consumption and your income and the increase in your deposits from the starting position to the ending position. So, that, that, so you cannot just say anything. There's a, as Lance Taylor says here, there's a limit to, there's only a certain number of things that you can say. And some of the other things that you could think could happen cannot because of these relationships because of this stock flow coherence that you must have, because of the fact that the stock that you have at the end has got to be equal to the stock that you had initially plus the saving that you are accumulating in every period. I don't know if that's clear. Um, an, exa an example of this, perhaps, is the quadruple entry principle, which was put forward by this American. He was an institutionalist. He was completely opposed to neoclassical economics. And Copeland was asked uh, by the Fed to set up the system of flow of funds in the US. So again, this was before 1953. And uh, his claim was that, well, because money flows or flow of funds transactions involve two transactions, the social accounting approach to money flows rests not on a double entry system but on a quadruple entry system. And Minsky said the same thing exactly in 1996. Every transaction in assets requires four entries. So that helps you to understand what goes on. For instance, here from the chapter two of the book, uh, we have a very, very simple uh, example. Uh, if uh, firms want to produce more, at some point they will need to uh, get access to more funds. So in this instance, I suppose that uh, they want to get they're getting more loans, so here I use the, in the book we use the letter L for loans. Uh, so they get a loan. The loan comes from who? It, get, it comes from the banks. So that's your two entries. But you need two other because the sum of the columns has also has to be zero. So if they got a loan, then it's got to be somewhere. So where is it? used, so to speak, well, here initially it's used as a deposit in their bank account. So, just a single thing, so just saying, I want a new loan, means you've got four entries. You need four entries, not just two, you need four. So if you were in a corporate account, you would just look at this. You would say, oh, this is double, you just need two entries, yes. It seems like this would be the case for a very small amount of time because then yeah. they would use these deposits to you know, pay their workers or buy investment goods or what have you. So, so you would cre be creating more um, loans or deposits and it's an infinite loop. New entries, you would get new entries. Right, so I mean how oh, do yeah. we... Well, if you look at, well, in the book, this is table 2.8a, so there's a okay. table 2.8b, which then explains what the, the firms are going to do with their money. They're going to use it to pay workers. Right. So then you're going to have the households here. They're going to receive a wage payment, and they, they're going to get the deposits that was initially in the bank account of the firms. Now it's going to get moved to the bank account of the house. So in terms of time, I mean, how do we make it consistent? I mean, how many transactions would we include uh, to make it stock flow 
consistent because if, if these two exist at a particular instant of time, then the others could exist simultaneously. So, I mean, that, that to me seems like a potential challenge. Well, I mean, either you, okay, either you are trying to tell a story, to, trying to explain what happens, which is part of the realist methodology of heterodox economics. So, as you do that, then you, that's exactly what you would be doing. You would be making, okay, you would say, this is how it starts. Then in the very next moment, maybe one second later, the, the workers get paid. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you would have another table explaining, well, in the next, uh, after that, what do the workers do with their deposits? Mm -hmm. Well, they use some of it to uh, purchase consumption goods. So then here also it will be changing. So you can tell, uh, uh, that's the monetary circuit story. So, uh, you know, I come from this tradition, this is what uh, has to be done. Um, but on the other hand, if you, you tell the story, but there's a limit to it, then, you, you know, well, what percentage of your income did you spend? What was your propensity to consume? So as soon as you go into that, then you have to leave that, and you've got to move into the, the model. Uh, that's why I always say, well, the, the monetary circuit story of the French and Italian school, Graziani, Alain Parguez, and all that, uh, it's good as a story, but you cannot just leave, remain there. You have to go beyond that. And, and when you go beyond that, your matrix corresponds to the situation at the end of the period. Same here. I know we are in MMT uh, country here, uh, <laughs> so I assume that indeed the central bank uh, was uh, uh, well. Here, the central bank was uh, purchasing bills or bonds from the government, so that the government was now acquiring cash in its account at the central bank. So, so that's another example of how the story would start. Okay. I'm not sure we'll be able to finish at about 30. Uh, I'm not sure if you guys want a break or, I mean, what do you prefer? Um, I'm happy to keep going. But. Yeah? Okay. Yeah, me too. All right, you tell me when you're tired, when you're exhausted. Okay, uh, well, portfolio decisions. Initially, I did not intend to have those slides, but, you know, uh, some. So here, I cannot assume you know <coughs> this, so I'll, I'll talk a bit about it. Uh, as I said before, SFC integrates the stock part and the flow part. Here, uh, maybe focus a little bit more on the stock part. Uh, so the, all these stock flow consistent models are based, uh, in fact, on the Tobin's portfolio equation, James Tobin's portfolio equation. So what Tobin assumes back in 1969 and also in other papers, 1980, 1982, in his Nobel Prize lecture, Sorry, Bank of Sweden lecture. Uh, the, uh, he, he assumes that financial assets are imperfect substitutes. Now, for some reason, in the 1980s, this assumption became uh, totally dead, and all models were assuming that everything was a perfect substitute. But since about 2005, uh, it has come back being fashionable even, even among neoclassical authors. You know, Blanchard now is uh, doing this, so it's, it's a little bit surprising. Anyway, 
when Godly starts from Tobin, he modifies it slightly, and I would even argue uh, corrects it, because there's a slight mistake. And uh, this, in fact, looks very much like the versions of portfolio choice that were proposed by Peter Scott in his book in 1989 and in two uh, articles by Randy Ray that were published in 1991 and 1992. So uh, even Randy had uh, a say in those, uh, I don't think he presented anymore uh, to his students, but in the 1990s he was concerned with this. So what's this portfolio, how does it look like? Here I have three assets. I have demand deposits, I have a short-term uh, asset, which you can imagine as being a bill, and here you have a long-term asset, LT for long-term, which you can imagine as being a bond, so you have the quantity of bonds, and that's the price of each bond. And that's how the equation looks like, so it looks a little bit complicated. But uh, basically what it means is very simple. If we use simply the first line, first row of the matrix, it simply says that deposits, the amount of deposits that you would like to hold, is a function of the wealth that you have. In fact, it would be your expected wealth. You know, when you are making the decision, it would depend on the expected wealth. And it depends on your income, in the sense that the larger your income, the larger the transactions you're going to make, and therefore the larger the amount of money that you need uh, to make the payments. Um, and so what are these coefficients? Well, those coefficients here, grosso modo, so broadly speaking, uh, represent the share of your wealth that you would like to have uh, in deposits, so uh, lambda one zero, the share of your wealth that you would like to have in the form of deposits. Uh, lambda two zero would be the share of your wealth that you would like to have in short term assets, and this in long term assets. However, this is modulated. This share that you would like to have is slightly modified by the various rates of interest that you can get on these various assets. So, th this is, so those are the, the parameters that have this modulating influence on, on this share. And finally, you have another parameter here for income. So you can already guess that there's got to be some constraints on those parameters. Those parameters cannot be anything. Uh, they have to respect uh, some conditions. And for instance, the sum of those three parameters, uh, lambda 1, 0, 2, 0, 3, 0, has to be equal to 1. And the reason is, if you imagine a, sim the s a simplified model, where interest rates have no impact on your decisions and where the amount of money, uh, sorry, the level of income Y has no impact either on you know, whether you want to hold more uh, deposits or more other assets, then the, the model would stop here. You would, that the, your portfolio model will only be this. And in fact, this is basically what Randy Ray would was having in his 1991-1992 papers. So the sum of those three things has to be equal to one. So that's one uh, condition that has to be fulfilled. And then there are other conditions uh, that have to be uh, fulfilled. Here I have, so that's the first one I was mentioning. But then you have others that have to be fulfilled as well. Uh, those are the conditions that had been underlined by Tobin. And those are the additional conditions that have been underlined by, uh, by Wayne Godley. So I took that, uh, yeah, it's, it's similar in the book and in the new book uh, coming out. So I, I don't want to emphasize, so those are called the vertical conditions, those are called the horizontal conditions. Uh,
when you build a model and you have a, a number of assets in your in your model, uh, it's you certainly have those conditions certainly have to be fulfilled. Otherwise, you're really not coherent, and it's best to have these being fulfilled as well. It will make if you want the the portfolio choice super coherent. I don't want to try to explain because it's a little bit complicated. Uh, so if you're interested, you, you can go uh, and watch. But of course, the you know the really important condition is this one and these others. And again, uh, in in the 2000s, sometimes I was looking at some papers. I remember a French colleague who had a a model that seemed to be simple, but in the end, it was generating incredibly complicated cycles and not even and all kinds of. Uh, trajectories, and I realized the only reason why he was getting these weird results was that these conditions here were not being fulfilled in his model. Then I told him, he never published anything on the topic again. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> He's a <coughs> well-known Minsky in, in France. Um, but, yes. So, so, as you know, Fotis Lissandru has uh, recently sort of criticized the portfolio balance approach and yeah. has said that it doesn't reflect accurately how uh, financial asset prices were set in and leading up to the global financial crisis. So do you, do you think that's sort of, that's right? Do you think that this approach works nonetheless or do we need something else? And if so, do you have any idea yeah. what that might be? Uh, I think I talked a bit. Okay. 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 So I mean, your question is related to this buffers versus market clearing. So what Lisandro is saying. Uh, Everybody says is in neoclassical economics, markets clear through price changes. So, in our post Keynesian view of stock flow consistency, uh, in, and in post Keynesian economics in general, markets clear either because quantities supplied are assumed to adjust to demand within the period or because of buffers. Buffers being, for instance, stocks of inventories that firms have in case there's an increase, in, sudden increase in demand and they cannot increase production right away, well at least they have stocks of inventories. Well you go to uh, buy a car and you can see lots of uh, cars in inventories. Uh, now what Lisandro, who is a guy in finance in, uh, in England is saying is that uh, he was claiming in his article that uh, we didn't go far enough that in his view, even financial markets adjust either through supplies or through buffers, so through changes in stocks, that there are some dealers or some specialists who hold some stocks of bonds and, and who you know, try to limit the, the fluctuations in prices. And, and he, he had also another argument, but I'll leave it aside. So uh, the answer to that is that, yeah, it's in, in, uh, in our models, the price mechanism only plays a clearing role for stock market equities. So I told him, you didn't read carefully the, the, our book because you would have seen that in our book, even the market for bills or the market for bonds is adjusted somehow by the decisions of the central bank or the decisions of the government to issue more bonds or less bonds. So I said, I told him, you know, we, we do exactly what you say we should be doing. The only exception is stock market equities or stock market shares, where we assume that all of the adjustment was in prices. And what he's saying is that, well, even in, on the stock market, you've got some buffers. That's his claim. I don't know. Is he, is he right? I mean, most people, I think, would believe that on the stock market, it's really price adjustment. That's, that there's not much role for buffers. Or, you know, so. um, right. So, 
go, oh, oh it was right that time. <laughs> so there's always a buffer in, in those stock flow consistent models. There's always a buffer because we don't have price, this neoclassical price adjustment. We don't believe that's the main adjustment. And so there you go. Uh, for producing firms, you have stocks of inventories and also the amount of loans that firms need to take. Uh, households, it's money deposit. It's like you. If suddenly you receive a thousand dollars from your grandma, well, suddenly your money deposits uh, move up by a thousand dollars. That's your that's your buffer. Uh, and for private banks, it will be either the advances from central banks, if you are in a European system, or the amount of bills that banks hold. That will usually be their buffer. So there's always a buffer out there. Excuse me. Yeah. It, this is more a retrospective analysis always, or does it have like... Well, yeah, it's ex post, you know, you, uh, or, or, or uh, suppose you, uh, you're supposed to get the check from uh, the university because you're a teaching assistant. And you thought you would be getting it just before Christmas, but oops, there's a mistake and you only get it in January. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, you were planning to buy all these gifts for your girlfriends. And, <laughs> <laughs> and so your money deposits is, are going to go down, you know. So that's your buffer. That's how you... Or it could be uh, your credit card... Uh, the buffer will be the amount of money that you uh, you have accumulated on your credit card. That's another possible buffer. There's got to be a buffer. Uh, okay, here I have a statement by Godin, Tsiou, uh, who was uh, a student of Mazier, working with Kinsella for a while. And this is exactly uh, what they say. In the model, every column sums to zero. And it follows that once every variable in the column bar except one has been determined, that last variable is logically implicit. So yeah, that goes to what you said. It's, it's exposed, so to speak. This logical constraint on the sum of the sector's activities has a causal interpretation with all decisions having to be made in an uncertain world, there has to be for every sector some component of the sum of their transactions which flexibly takes on the character of a residual and which, as Godley Lavo emphasized, cannot be directly controlled. So this buffer is the residual. It's got to be something that gives because all the decisions cannot be compatible with all of the others. In neoclassical theory, what gives is the price. Uh, there will be some price adjustment. If it's not there, and I believe most of the time it's not there, then most of the time, almost always, it's, uh, there's got to be something that will give up. It has to be one variable that will be a residual compared to the other. So you may decide on the amount of money you're going to spend for your consumption this week based on some expectations. But if your expectations are not realized, then there has to be something that will adjust to that. So there is an analysis also within this framework about the transition between that exposed situation and ex ante situation. You could say that. I mean, you, you in in the models, you you will have many behavioral equations that will depend on expectations. But generally speaking, your expectations will not be realized. Uh, for instance, in the portfolio equations, oops, in the portfolio equations. The wealth that you were expecting may not be the wealth that is being realized. Uh, and so, uh, you know, your, the realized wealth uh, will be the sum of what you had before and your actual saving. But your actual saving may be quite different from what you thought you would have 
during this period. But your portfolio decisions have to be based some, you know, basically on what you were expecting. And, and so one of these variables has to be the buffer, has to be the residual. And in our models, usually we consider, well, that would be the demand deposits that you have at the bank. That if you decide that you want uh, a certain amount of uh, bills in your portfolio, indeed you will have it. But if your wealth is lower than what you thought, then it's this that will absorb the difference. So once you know that exposed, that, does that give you any idea about how to behave or, how to, or what to do in the future? Well, then in the future, uh, you, uh, you, your, your consumption in the next period will depend perhaps on the discrepancy well, depend on your income, of course, but may depend on the discrepancy between the wealth that you want to achieve and the wealth that you have. And so that's, that's, I mean, that's what we have in our models. Anybody can have something else as, a, as an idea. I mean, Win, for Win, his idea was that he, he was convinced that uh, people had uh, a wealth to income ratio, a wealth to income ratio target. So that if your income was, I don't know, $100,000, then, then you would give yourself a certain target for your wealth, maybe half a million dollars. And that you would gradually try to achieve that target. So I, I asked him, you know, do you really, is that really how you, you, you go? <coughs> he told me yes. I told me, I told him, you know, this was around 2000 when I had uh, my three kids and all that, and my salary was lower. Uh, I told him, well, in our household, we spend everything that comes in. <laughs> everything that goes in goes out. There is no black hole, you know. It just <laughs> so uh, yeah, but I mean, you can. That's the, uh, a bit later I'll say it, but I, I, I might as well say it right away. Uh, when Godley was persuaded that by having this stock flow consistent approach, it would eliminate most of the controversies in macroeconomics. He was convinced, you know, this is, you know, we, finally we're going to find a way to uh, stop arguing with each other on, on, on all those little details. But in reality, the results that you get from these models are highly dependent on the kind of behavioral equations that you are putting in. <laughs> so if, we, if two different researchers put in different behavioral equations, then the the, the end result and even the path towards this end result might be quite different. And, and so, contrary to Wynne's hopes, it hasn't, I mean, <laughs> it hasn't uh, killed controversies. I mean, we had this model 2000 with Wynne that was published in 2001-2002, and, and we achieved some results. You know, uh, if you do this, then this happens to this or that variable. And I thought those were fairly secure results, but just four or five years later, uh, someone else, Till Bantry, came up with a slightly different model, and uh, and then it turned out that what the result we were, some of the results we were getting were just one particular case <laughs> among two or three. You know, it was just a special case among two or three. So uh, the behavioral. As I said, it's a method, but behavioral equations play a very important role. And different people will have different ideas about what is the correct behavioral equation for consumption or for investment. Feature of all those post-Keynesian models that they are essentially demand-led. 
it's possible to introduce some kind of supply side constraints like a Phillips curve is considered to be one. Uh, you can introduce other supply effects uh, when uh, you know, if, if some firms default on their loans, you can assume that somehow their capital stock uh, suddenly, part of their capital stock suddenly disappears, so you can't produce as much as before. So it's possible to introduce supply side effects in these models. We, we didn't concentrate on that, uh, but that certainly is something that can be done. We, the only thing we introduced at some point was a kind of Phillips curve. Although Wynn was very, didn't believe very much in these Phillips curves. Uh, optimize, so that's one thing that different, differentiates post, these post keynesian models from others. The other thing is this, is in neoclassical theory you have constrained optimization. Uh, in post keynesian models, what we assume though at least in our models, is that we assume there's a stock flow target or even sometimes a flow flow target. So here you have examples of these. The inventories to sales ratio, uh, I don't think many people would argue against that. The wealth to disposable income ratio that I was talking about, so some may have it, others don't. Capital adequacy ratios for banks uh, and so on. So, uh, and how do people react? People react to the fact that their target ratio has not been achieved. So they will react to that by trying to close this, the discrepancy. And uh, Duménil and Lévy, who are two uh, French, uh, well-known French uh, Marxist economists, that's exactly what they do. And they are very, they very strongly argue as I said yesterday, that the ad hoc uh, researchers are the neoclassical people. They're saying, our micro, this is kind of micro foundation, so to speak. Uh, our, they, Duminel and Lévy have the same micro foundations as we do in our stock flow consistent models, in the sense that they also have targets, and they argue that it's this these disequilibria, so the fact that the target is not achieved, this will generate some response from the firms, from the households, possibly from the government, uh, from the banks, and that will explain, uh, say, the, what happens in, during the transitions. Yes? I don't know, but... These two seem a little similar to me. I mean, optimization mm -hmm. under constraints. Uh, so, inventories to sales ratio, I mean, these would be considered as, you know, constraints. And then, trying to close the discrepancy is a type of satisficing, if not optimization. Yeah, it is satisficing. That's exactly what I would argue. Uh, uh, yeah, to some extent you're right, because P Peter Scott, for instance, would say that all these uh, targets can be derived from some optimizing uh, mm -hmm. formula, right. from some opti optimizing behavior. I remember presenting at his university in Denmark back in the 1990s, uh, was, uh, he, he was surrounded by all of his neoclassical colleagues, which is why he left to UMass. And, uh, and so he, was, he tried to excuse me, <laughs> uh, saying, well, you know, what Lavoie is doing in those growth models, I, I can't remember what I presented, uh, uh, all these conditions can be obtained if you assume some imperfections in optimizing frameworks. based on some constraint. But this 
behavior or inventory to sales ratio like that. So you're satisfying, but you're not actually doing this um, differential calculus. The, the behavior is different. The actual, in, re, in real time, the behavior is different than in this kind of neoclassical world. I agree. This is the reason, though, why it's not calculus, though, isn't it just that it's a discrete time model as opposed to continuous time? I, I think you can have the same models with continuous time. I mean, yeah. th that's another but, but then it, I'm, I'm just saying that then it would be sort of similar to the neoclassical. It would be using calculus. So it's, it, it's not necessarily so much the math, the, the, the method of which particular math you're using, but it's, it's, it's the, the behavioral assumptions. And it's like, for example, the, the fact that you close the model with the endogenous money uh, the money supply equals money demand. That's what really makes it post-Keynesian as opposed to you know, cost. Well, uh, you know, with the new consensus, you also have uh, these neoclassical models where uh, money supply seems to adjust to the money demand. So I'm not sure this is the true uh, feature, distinguishing feature. Yeah. Isn't the point simply that you can add some ad hoc assumptions to neoclassical idea of maximization, like search costs or you know the expense of yeah. and you then know, you'll get this. engaging in marginal calculus or something like yeah. that, and then you would amount to yeah. targeting. Yeah. yeah, right. That's a, a good way to put it. Yes. Yeah, so why introduce these highly complicated things? when you can go straight to, to these ratios. Isn't the, sorry to keep yeah, on this right. point. Um, these ratios, though, it, it, shouldn't we distinguish what people are actually doing? So if you're getting, if you're using neoclassical economics and optimizing and then doing some ad hoc analysis, adding that on to afterwards, and then, set, then at that point you get to something like these ratios. I mean, don't we want to know in reality what people are actually doing? I mean, are, are they really, if you look at businesses, banks, households, you look at their behavior and you, and you take the neoclassical example, are they actually doing that? You know, and I would argue no, they're not doing that. So I think it, to me at least it matters whether or not um, in reality, you're following an optimization or not. Well, I entirely agree with you, and that's part of the you know realistic, starting from realistic assumptions or not. So, from a heterodox point of view, it's more important to try to, as you say, actually describe the behavior of agents. Uh, whereas in neoclassical economics, it's more important to uh, assume that they are optimizing something. And then, as you just said, you, you start from something which is completely unrealistic, and then you realize, oh yeah, that's not quite it. So then you try to superpose to this something more realistic, and then what Caldor would say is that the foundations uh, are are no good, and so the whole structure crumbles. Uncertainty. And really? yeah, not even and <laughs> we're, we haven't haven't even <laughs> mentioned the word radical uncertainty. Yes. Okay. Uh, okay, and now we come to the last uh, last part, third part. So, is it okay if I go a bit over twelve thirty? Yes. It's okay for me too. My plane is at four. <laughs> uh, so problems and possible solutions of the SFC approach. So that's the perhaps the more slightly more uh, advanced part. Um, maybe I'll just uh, well, okay. All, all I'll say is that when you build these models, uh, you have a number of equations. It's a little bit like the Walrasian. Uh, model, general equilibrium model, where you, you say that the last 
equation depends on all the others. Uh, here you have uh, the same. As you build the model, there's a certain number of identities. Uh, but you cannot include all the identities in the model. There is one of them that must be removed, that must not be put in the computer program. Otherwise, the software will tell you that the model is over-determined. And so this last equation that you keep for yourself, it could be something as simple as uh, the money supply is equal to, say, the amount of deposit is equal the supply of deposit is equal to the demand for deposit. This last equation we call either the redundant equation or the hidden equation because it's not in the program. Uh, so th this is some, just something you must be uh, careful about. The good thing about this hidden equation or redundant equation is that uh, once you have entered all the equations, perhaps found an equilibrium, and perhaps uh, run it with a, a shock, is that uh, if your redundant equation is not fulfilled, then it means that either the da 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 data, the data that you started with, uh, is not coherent, or, so that's okay, that can be solved uh, pretty quickly, or there's a mistake in one of your equations <laughs> that you have written up in the program. So that's when it becomes complicated because sometimes it can be pretty hard to find the mistake. You know, you look at the equations, they, could, they seem all right. Uh, Sometimes you have to wait a couple of days and come back to have a fresh mind to find out what the mistake is. If there's only 10 or 12 equations, you will easily find it. But if you have 80 or 100 equations, then it can be <laughs> quite painful. Uh, and it happened once, it happened once that in one of our models in the book, we had two mistakes. And they were exactly covering each other. <laughs> uh, but then, at some point, we realized that, oh, no, no, this is, there's something really wrong <laughs> with what we have. Uh, but usually, even if you have three or four or five mistakes, <laughs> uh, they will not cover each other. And so by checking the last equation, you can find out whether there's a mistake. Uh, another thing is that computers, you know, the, uh, all these simulation programs make little tiny mistakes. But so if you are running the model for 300, 400, 500 periods, then the little errors will add up. And so uh, sometimes you have the impression that, oh my god, my money supply is not equal to my money demand anymore. But that's not because there's a mistake in the model, it's just because of the simulation program. Um, okay, closures. Uh, there's always the problem of choosing the proper closure. This is the word which is used by Lance Taylor in his various books uh, ever since the, the 1980s. Um, so, Sometimes you choose a, a certain closure and then you want to change it. And then what happens is that you have to, you can't just change one equation. You usually have to change two, perhaps sometimes two, sometimes three, sometimes four. And you have to bump equations, so to speak. Uh, and that can become, uh, sometimes it's, uh, I mean, especially when we were working with two country models, uh, sometimes it, it, it became a little bit of a nightmare. Uh, but some other people, like Jacques Mazier, <laughs> he, 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 this French uh, polytechnician, he, he seems to have no problem in bumping equations and all that. <laughs> uh, but Winnie and I, we, it, it, it took us a lot of thinking to finally get it. Okay, so for instance, if you have a two-country model, it can be closed uh, in, in several ways. You can close the model as a flexible exchange rate model, or you can close the model as a fixed exchange rate model. But even if you have a fixed exchange rate model, you can close it 
in at least three different ways. So the, the standard way in closing a fixed exchange rate uh, model would be to assume that one of the two central banks accepts to purchase or sell any foreign assets at the constant exchange rate. So that's the assumption that you have endogenous foreign reserves. So that's the standard assumption that you find in most textbooks when you are being explained what happens if you have a fixed exchange rate. You, you would certainly know that. Uh, so if you have a balance of payments deficit, then your foreign, foreign exchange reserves just progressively go down. But you can close the model in a different way. You could assume that interest rates are let to move freely to keep the exchange rate constant, with foreign, foreign exchange reserves remaining constant. So you have to bump equations to achieve that. Or you could assume this seems to be, well, I was going to say about the Eurozone, but of course, yeah, the Eurozone, you can say it's a fixed exchange rate model. Or you could assume that the government expenditures are let to move freely to keep the exchange rate constant while foreign exchange reserves stay constant. Not, e not exactly the situation of the Eurozone, but you know, we could argue that all these countries from the south of the Eurozone are being forced to reduce their government expenditures so that their balance of payments or their current account balance with the rest of the Eurozone uh, is roughly constant and, or, or even is decreasing towards uh, zero. So it's just to tell you that these, there's a large amount of flexibility. I mean, these models can be modified uh, and you can see whether, if you do this, suppose you have this, okay, suppose you have two countries, you do this, uh, you assume, I don't know, Colombia is on a fixed exchange rate with uh, the US. Uh, at some point, the Colombia is going to run out of uh, reserves. So, uh, what is the possible alternative for Colombia? Well, maybe they can reduce government expenditures. And in our models, it, it does the trick. I mean, it will create a lot of unemployment, reduce uh, output, but it will keep the exchange rate constant and foreign reserves you know, will, will remain uh, constant. Or you can raise interest rates, attracting foreign capital. But in, in all of our models, it doesn't work. That just generates, you know, progressively you get worse and worse situation. So that's a feature, uh, a characteristic feature of uh, stock flow consistent models with two countries. Um, so, how do you construct this model? If you, if you want the, the PowerPoint, I can send it to Matthew. Matthew can, can perhaps send it to you if you're interested. So, how do you construct the, the models? I say here in a traditional way, meaning this is the way we have been doing it in the past, but there are more fancy people now working on, on these things. Uh, I was mentioning Kinsella in, uh, in Ireland. We try to do it uh, otherwise. So usually you just, uh, well, you start by assuming that all stocks of the balance sheet add up, meaning that you make sure that all your starting stocks are consistent with each other. They all, they all fulfill the rows and the columns. Then you try to make sure, that can be complicated, that row identities of the transactions flow matrix are also fulfilled. So that can be more uh, complicated. You make sure that the portfolio coefficients also add up. And, and then you start the model. You have all your behavioral equations and you start the model. If indeed you have these conditions fulfilled, and indeed if the equilibrium is stable, I try to uh, I should have underline if, then the, you push on the button and there ooh, it will drive you to the steady state or to a stationary state if you don't have growth embedded in the model. The problem is that in some more complex models, 
uh, or if you don't, if you have parameter values which are too large or too small, uh, you're not gonna, the model is not going to be stable. So it's not going to drive you towards the steady state. And then you're going to have to play around with the values of the various parameters. So as an example, the value of the propensity to consume out of income or other or reaction function of the investment function and so on. Um, so I, I've had students who, you know, thought, oh, this is great, chapter 10, 11, 100 equations, I'll just do the same. I'll introduce real estate and I'll go ahead. And I tell the students, don't do it compl complex at the beginning, do it simple and introduce feedback relations which may generate instability, do that at the very end. Make it as simple as possible at the beginning. Because otherwise you will never find a starting point. You will never find, a, you know, you want to start from something which is some kind of equilibrium where you can compare what you have to what you would have if some parameter was changing. Uh, so you've got to start from something simple, otherwise uh, you may, it may take you a year <laughs> to achieve the, which happened to that student, to achieve the starting stationary or uh, steady state you know, uh, equilibrium. Then once you have the steady state equilibrium, then you can introduce, as I said, more complex relationships, more feedbacks, positive or negative, and then you can see uh, that, oh, this feedback effect now is making my model explode. So you know that this equation is the one responsible for your model becoming unstable. So that is interesting because you know that this variable or this parameter is, uh, you know, generating um, instability in, in, in your economy. But if you start from a complex model right away, you will never find out. <laughs> you will never finish. And, uh, yeah. My student, that student, uh, after a year, he gave up and he, he started out completely uh, with a much, you know, five times simpler model and, uh, and finally finished his dissertation. So, you know, it was, it was uh, rather iffy, but not, was not very good because uh, he just spent too much time. Uh, he was about to be, you know, in our university, seven years is the maximum in the PhD program. So. I was once... Uh, uh, on, the, on the jury of a student who took 22 years. <laughs> it was in France. It was in France. And uh, when I went to the thesis defense, there were about 60 people in the room. I, mean, I had never seen that. <laughs> but those were all his former students, all his colleagues, <laughs> his family. And uh, I mean, he had three uh, thesis advisors because they would all become dead one of the <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm kidding, they were retiring. <laughs> they had all retired. And several wives. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in France, that's, that's what happens. Okay, and so once you have the equilibrium, once you have the steady state, then you can introduce those more complex equations, or, or, or if you're happy with what you have, you just do these what we call experiments. You change the value of a parameter and you, you see what happens. <coughs> what happens in your short run and what happens towards the long run. Okay, so limits of the stock flow consistent model are clearly uh, as you add equations, behavioral equations, uh, then it becomes very quickly uh, complicated. So uh, a partial way out is, uh, has been suggested by Mouakid is that when you, you have what he calls ordinary identities, for instance, if uh, 
on a row there are only two items, then he says, why bother distinguishing, it comes a bit to your question, why bother distinguishing between the supply of consumption and the demand for consumption? Just write it as consumption so you have one less equation to worry about. So, uh, but still, even if you do that, models can remain uh, pretty large. So that's the drawback of this method. It becomes pretty heavy. This is why I'm saying I, I wouldn't certainly expect everybody to, to do it. You, you, it's good that some people do it, but not everybody. The, the other issue is what I, I talked about is should we use continuous time equations or should, so differential equations, or should we use discrete time equations, so difference equations. Wynne Godley came from empirical work. In empirical work, you only get data every three months. So for him, the obvious thing was, well, we should use difference equations. Many of my colleagues believe who are into this kind of thing, like uh, uh, Peter Scott, Steve Keen, uh, Peter Flaschel, they believe that it's much simpler to use differential equations. So it depends, you know, personally, I don't mind. I think there's something good to be said for either one. Uh, so if you're more into differential equations, go forward. I don't think there's any problem with that. Uh, controversies remain. I've already mentioned that uh, SFC does not remove controversies in macroeconomics. Um, the, the other limit, and I'm going to talk more about that, and I'm almost through, it's the need for calibration and empirically based work. There's very little empirically based work. There's also little work. So I would say the first step is perhaps calibration. The second step is you know, using real data. Uh, so calibration would, be <coughs> would mean using parameter values that have that somehow you can find in the literature from previous empirical work. Uh, so that would be the, the first step. But in our book, we, we didn't, re I mean, we didn't try that. Uh, some people laugh because in our first uh, chapter, well, chapter three, first model, we have the propensity to consume out of income, which is six, 0 0.6 and the propensity to consume out of wealth, which is 0 0.4. Well, obviously, those are not realistic whatsoever. But, you know, so we, we, with more complex models, we try to be a bit more realistic in, the, uh, in choosing parameters. But generally speaking, it, it was none of our concern. You know, it was just to show what the method was. But certainly more effort needs to be put in that, and some people are, are doing it. And similarly, you know, you would like to, ch to start from real data. You know, you have a matrix of uh, assets. Well, why not start with assets which roughly correspond to a country or another? So there are some people who have done it. Uh, Student of Mazier have, have done it. Uh, Kinzella is trying to have a, a, a model for uh, Ireland. In Iceland, they have decided to have, uh, I went there, gave a talk there, and uh, uh, one of the person inviting me uh, was very excited with stock flow consistent models. He was also very excited with fencing because he had been a fencer himself. <laughs> <laughs> I said, why do you invite me to talk about post-Kinsian economics? I'm in Canada and you're in Iceland, you're next to Europe. I said, what? That's because you do fencing. <laughs> um, so that, that really is, uh, is the issue. Uh, well, that, that's something else. Uh, one of the reasons, I mean, you may wonder why was all this work by James Tobin, which was so exciting, abandoned after 1982? Uh, two reasons. One was that in 1982, when Tobin got the Nobel Prize, his funding got cut off. Uh, 
you know, this was this is the time where uh, new classical economics, rational expectations, and all that was the fashionable thing. And what Tobin was doing, despite the fact he got just got the Nobel Prize, uh, was considered to be worthless. So at this, so he was trying, he was starting to engage into empirical work. I mean, Tobin was like us. He was doing first theoretical work, and then the second step was doing more empirically based work. But the funding got cut off. In 1982, if you wanted to do empirical work, you needed those little cards which you, you were punching, had to bring to the computer center, then you would get them back a day later, you know, and so on. And wasn't <laughs> so if you did not have assistance, you, you were done. You know. And so that was the first problem. The second problem was uh, that you know people trying to do um, empirical work with this method had problems of collinearity, you know, because you had several interest rates; they were tied to each other. So, and I, I'm not, I don't know, uh, but I, I was, I'm just asking the question here: Do the new time series techniques would they help to face that kind of problem? That that caused this program with James Tobin to stop. Um, so calibration and the real world data. Uh, here you have a statement by Godantiu and Kinsella, um, who, who are outlining what the problem is. Uh, I think I've, I've given you, okay, so what, here is what they say. Finding stock flow norms is at present a black art and more error than trial is involved in finding them. So this is no good intellectually, but it also raises a practical concern over the stability of these models. So basically, what happens is that when we build the model, we finally achieve um, uh, we finally achieve a, a, a configuration which is stable, but how do we know if, you know, that perhaps there are other configurations out there which are also stable, but which would give rise to completely different dynamics? So we don't know that. Uh, if the models are sensitive to small changes in the values of simple parameters like the propensity to consume out of past income by households, for instance, then how valid are they as representations of reality? Maybe the model that we have is a good model, but and you know explains what happens, but maybe it has no relationship whatsoever to the reality, because the parameters that we have used do not correspond to at least past reality, to, or to the present. Maybe they, they just don't. So uh, maybe by choosing other parameters, it would give us a completely different dynamics, as I was saying. So the contribution of our paper, the paper by Godin, Tew, Kinsella, and indeed the effort of our research program, so what they're trying to achieve there in, uh, in Ireland, is to provide the missing link between the simulated world described by Godley and Lavoie to a coherently estimated model built from real world data. So their point is that if we start from real world data, then we can try to estimate what the values of the parameters are, and then we maybe we cannot predict what will happen, but at least we, we you know we have a much better idea that what we're doing corresponds better to the actual world. Uh, so they propose a method, they propose an algorithm, uh, and, and, and then from the uh, real world stock values and flow data that they get from the national accounts or the flow of funds, they then try to estimate the parameter values. However, th this is not an, a, an easy task. For instance, in the model of chapter three of the book, which is uh, the SIM model, which is really, really simple for those who have, who have seen it. it and you, you can solve it analytically, so there's no difficulty in that. The method does well for some parameters. So the method that they adopt 
will get you tax rates which so you will estimate what the tax rate is from the model that was constructed and this estimated tax rate will indeed correspond to the one that was used to build the model but it will not work for some of the other parameters for instance when you try to estimate the propensities to consume out of current income and out of wealth so there are two uh, you can come up with results that are completely incoherent with the parameters that you started to build the model. Uh, and the reason is, well, there, there's not enough equations to find out the values of all the parameters, even in such a simple thing. So, uh, in French we say, on n'est pas sorti du bois, in English we're not out of the woods. Uh, you know, they, it's not so simple. So I, I'm not sure what the solution is. Uh, maybe there are other people more into econometrics who could easily find a solution, but it's not so simple. Um, <clears throat> here is a statement by uh, Biagio uh, Cufo, who is an Italian researcher. He's an expert in um, simulations, uh, uh, you know, but he's, he's more of a guy in computing science than someone in economics. And he made a presentation uh, in Berlin. I, I was there. It was, it, was, it was a really... Was he, was he at the workshop? Piaggio uh, Cufo? No. Maybe not. He works with the um, European Commission. And uh, you know, what he presented was really interesting. Here is, is what he says. Uh, using SFC models is made rather complicated by the fact that these models become complex and hence intractable once they seek to incorporate more features of reality. Thus, analytical solutions are difficult to obtain, if at all. You can build models where you can find analytical, you know, algebraic solutions Peter Scott usually tries to simplify things enough that he can find algebraic solutions. But as soon as you introduce some nonlinearities, you're, you're done. Um, well, this is what I say here. In, in particular, once nonlinearity is introduced, uh, then the possibility of multiple equilibria emerges. So, solving the model numerically for pre-selected parameter values can therefore help to overcome the first problem. And this approach is therefore frequently used by modelers. In fact, this is exactly what we do with Godley and others that have followed us. We use simulations. Okay, accordingly, the researcher selects one or several sets of parameter values which are economically plausible and then evaluates the model using these values for both short and long run equilibria. So this is what we do. This, as I said, we try, I mean, if, if this is what we could have done if we had tried harder, and some people try hard and try to start with parameter values which seem reasonable, and then maybe twist them a little bit so as to solve the model and find values for variables that are reasonable. For instance, you know, you start with what you think are reasonable, plausible parameter values, then you run the model, then you get a rate of utilization of capacity which is equal to 120%. Well, all right, then you have to tweak a little bit some of the parameter values, and finally you have a rate of utilization of 80%. Then you can start to make all your experiments. Okay, so this guy, uh, well, okay, so then he says, Alas, this approach leads to another difficulty. How should parameters be selected in the first place? After all, for most parameters, there exists a host of economically plausible values, and by implication, there is almost an infinite number of plausible parameter combinations in the n-dimensional hyperspace of assumptions. So you may have, you know, 30 different parameters. 
So you give a value for each of these 30, but you know, maybe there's one parameter value which could go from 0 0.1 to 0 0.5. So then you would need to find some way of checking, well, what happens if it's 0 0.1? What happens if it's 0 0.5? Keeping the other 29 constant. Then you would need to take another parameter, keeping the other 29 constant, and do the same kind of exercise. So this guy has designed, uh, he, he can do that. He can do that. Uh, okay, so he uses a Monte Carlo approach. Okay, so I, I'm not going to go through the, but you know, he, he, he can have a program which does that very quickly. And, uh, and he even told us, uh, if you want it, I can send you the program. I couldn't know how to use it anyway. But. <laughs> <laughs> so th this is what he does here. So he's got this thing here. Here, okay, so what is it? And it's almost my last uh, slide. On the bottom here, he has A, which is the propensity to consume out of wealth, which he says, well, it's, it's, economically it could be between 0 and 1, maybe. And here we have VH, which stands for the wealth to income ratio of a household. And then he, uh, he, of course, he has a constant value for all the other parameters. He took the uh, Dos Santos and Zedza model of 2008 that was published in Metro Economica, which is one of the simpler models. And he uh, runs this. And all the little points, all the black points, are the results of the simulation. So with, uh, at 0 0.1, he can obtain uh, all these different values with by changing um, all the other parameters, you know, within also reasonable values uh, in the model. So uh, he claims he says, well, it seems to me that the propensity to uh, consume out of wealth cannot be bigger any bigger than 0 0.5 because he says as soon as you have parameter values bigger than 0 0.5, you know, which means that people would be spending in every period 50% of their wealth, more than 50%. Then you, you can get negative values for the wealth to income ratio, which of course makes no sense. And which is not surprising. I mean, if you spend so much, you're going to end up spending more than your income and gradually your wealth is going to go down. So this wealth to income ratio is the long run equilibrium result of this simulation. So obviously where you get the red arrows, he says, well, that makes no sense. And therefore, uh, it's only up to about 0 0.5 that all the equilibrium values of the wealth to income ratio are positive. Now, I would argue that uh, this wealth to income ratio, in reality, we know it's around 0 0.05. So at most, it, it's around this green line. So I'm, I would be saying, well, <coughs> this is a, the one that we should be testing, or we should be testing between 0 and maybe 0 0.07 uh, at most. But as you can see, even within this range, we can get almost, you know, we can get almost anything. It can get clear, close to zero or close to 2.5. So, uh, to summarize on this method, what I would say is first, number one, uh, it, it's good to have a non-economist -econ doing this, but, uh, but, you know, you need to have some economic background because you know, really what he should have been testing is this area here. Uh, and secondly, uh, it's a little bit disconcerting to see that you can get uh, a really wide range uh, of results. Right. So, conclusion, there are still lots to do. Uh, there are even now papers mixing agent-based modeling with the stock flow consistent approach. So we did have an impact on people doing agent-based modeling. Everybody does not need to do SFC models. And then I don't want to forget the draw of this uh, 
books? Uh, are you doing it now? Um, yeah, so did, did everyone who wants to be entered into the draw for this sign in? Because we we have all of the names and we're gonna sort of randomly uh, select someone. So then, did every is there? Did they randomly select oh. me? Okay. Well, <laughs> well, this is being done. Any question? Okay. Yes. Hey, is it possible to since it, uh, since we make different behavior and assumptions using this kind of modeling? Is it possible to identify which behavior and assumptions are more coherent with? what you have observed in the reality? Well, I think you that, that would be the role of econometric analysis. You know, try to, uh, to find what equation is giving you the best statistical properties for your variable. So that, that's done at another level. And, uh, another question related to that one is, uh, have you uh, thought about probably creating a classificatory system with different behavioral equations and recognizing that each behavioral equation is relevant for a certain historical period? Yeah, well, to we, we didn't do it, but yeah, certainly someone could be, um, yeah, that is certainly consistent with post Keynesian methodology that, you know, everything is not necessarily true all the time. Yeah. Um, how would you respond to the potential criticism that has been levied against the large scale uh, models like this, that they're just rehashing the you know, large scale uh, macroeconometric models from the 60s, like the hydraulic Keynesian model? I have heard that criticism been made in Paul Krugman news writing about when Godley said that. And I don't, is it, is it just that you have the additional verification mechanism of it being stock flow consistent? Or um, I, you know, behavioral what, assumptions yeah. brought in? I, you know, I, I think, uh, well, first Paul Krugman doesn't have a clue what, <laughs> what kind of work when Godley even did in the 1980s and doesn't have a clue what he was doing in the 1990s. Uh, on the other, on the one hand, you know, I mean, certainly it's more sophisticated than hydraulic, hydraulic Keynesianism because it has this full integration of monetary and real variables. Um, so that that's the certainly the the first thing. Um, and, and, and you know when Krugman wrote that, uh, you know I, I was a bit hurt in the sense that on the one hand he is saying that all we need to do is this simple ISLM model, uh, and I, I think this is you know much more sophisticated than ISLM's model. So it seemed to me that if you are uh, if you come from a university close to Paul Krugman, from an Ivy League university, then it's good. But if it comes from somewhere else, then it's no good. I, I, I were, and I'm not the only one. I mean, people were rather disappointed about Krugman's attitude with respect to this. So I, I don't know he, he, he knew what he was doing. Have there been any explicit analysis in the relationship between the methodology employed by Keynes in general theory and this uh, kind of model? Uh, I I would say it's in Keynes' spirit, but you know it's not Keynes. Uh, there, there are other people. For instance, I was in Boston two weeks ago. There was a paper being presented by Rod O'Donnell, who is a methodologist from uh, Australia, who has written extensively on Keynes, and he has created what he calls the YSLM model, uh, claiming that it truly represents what Keynes really meant. It has also two curves. Uh, but that's not our intent. You know, uh, it's, it, 
mean, what we're doing is post-Keynesian economics, but post-Keynesian meaning something much larger than just following Keynes or trying to be faithful to Keynes. It goes beyond that. You know, as I said yesterday, Keynes, to some extent, could be called a, a, an orthodox dissenter. I know it is shocking for some people. <laughs> uh, in the book that will be published, I have a f you know a couple of quotes from people. Uh, for instance, Herbert Simon himself saying that, uh, well, there isn't much difference between Keynes and neoclassical economics. He didn't see much difference.